You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode of Pizza Quest is brought to you by Central Milling, hand-selected grain, expertly milled for passionate bakers. Central Milling is the farmer, the miller, and the baker working together to preserve American farmland for tomorrow while providing the highest quality flour and grains for the bakers of today. Dating back over 150 years, Central Milling is built on generations of knowledge and they know that premium flour starts at the source. Employee-owned, Central Milling works directly with their farmers to sustainably grow grains that have exceptional flavor, nutrient content, color, and baking performance, which results in one of the largest selections of premium specialty flour and grains in the country. Hand-selected for the highest baking qualities, milled, cracked, or blended slowly to minimize heat generation, then bake-tested for performance. Learn more about Central Milling and their products at centralmilling.com. Welcome to Pizza Quest. I'm Peter Reinhardt, and uh, I'm excited about today's show because we're going to cover something that we haven't covered before, not in this step. This, we're going to talk about a new product that only a very few people know about, and uh, hopefully within a short time, a lot more of you will know about. I'm with Inya Rodman, the co-founder of New Culture Foods, which includes a mozzarella cheese that is totally dairy-free, vegan, uh, and yet performs pretty much exactly like traditional mozzarella cheese. And uh, and so, Inya, welcome. First of all, you're coming to us from the San Francisco Bay Area, where you're headquartered now. You've moved there, along with your business partner, uh, Matt Gibson, from your homes. He's from New Zealand, and you were originally from where? Croatia, actually. Cro- Hi, Peter. Croatia, wow. But then weren't you living in, in like, uh, London? Great- well, London? Yes, so I was you, in England so you, for a long time. So you guys kind of jumped the ponds and met up in, in the Bay Area and started a company, a new company. Um, and the result of that, as of right now, is, is, is one kind of cheese. I have a feeling there's going to be more kinds of cheeses coming now that you've kind of broken the code. Can you tell us a little bit about new culture and um, you know how it all came to be and and how you do it? Because there's a lot of vegan cheeses out there, but none of them could take make the claim of saying it's just like mozzarella cheese. And and uh, and so this is a new this is a new level. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Thanks so much for for having us. We are, are big fans of your work um, here at New Culture. Um, absolutely, and we are a new category. We, we're creating a new category of the product in the market that doesn't exist today. And what Matt and I um, joined forces to start New Culture, we were puzzled. Um, you know, we were both very focused on, you know, wanting to work in animal welfare and sustainability and um, and make simply better food products. And when we look at the landscape of what was made out there, there was a lot of effort uh, and a lot of amazing companies and plant-based meats, um, replacement meats, uh, you know, even cultivated meat where you grow real meat yeah. from cells. But at the time when this was five years ago, there was not um, that many people tackling uh, specifically dairy cheese uh, from um, a point of view of, again, animal welfare and sustainability. And we were really shocked to find out also that of all food that we humans produce, cheese is the sadly third worst product globally in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, land use, water use, uh, actually number one worse than water use of all food we make. Um, what is number one and two in terms of worst? It's beef and lamb, yeah. Beef and lamb and then cheese. Exactly. So and- great need then for something that's that's better for the earth. Exactly. And as you, I'm sure, yourself uh, would agree, cheese is incredibly tasty and addictive and attractive. And it's very hard. I, like for me, it's very hard to give up on it. Yeah. Um, and the plant-based cheeses that are out there have just been, how to say, not doing justice, you know? They're not doing good job to transition people who love cheese uh, off cheese. Yeah, they're functional, but they're not they're not mind-blowingly delicious like real cheese. No, and 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 actually, they're not even functional. So, if you were to speak to anyone who's using vegan cheese for pizza, 
you know, for again, pizza, we're obsessed with pizza and mozzarella. The functionality you need is stretch and melt yeah. um, and, and mouthfeel, right? Mouthfeel, elasticity, browning, all of these things, oil release. It's just impossible to achieve it with plant-based products. So Matt and I saw a big gap here um, and we wanted to figure out how can, like, why is this the case? Why can no one make better vegan cheese that people have been trying for a very long time? Yeah. And we figured out that there is a fundamental you know, scientific reason for it. And that is that if you look at cheese, you know, people will eat it and munch it and golf it, but they won't take it under a microscope. But if you were to look at it and understand its structure, it's actually this network of a protein called casein protein that's um, only found in mammalian milk in nature. And this protein is super unique. You can think of it as a, you know, superhero. It's the very, in a world of proteins, it's a very different, weird protein. And it enables milk to transition into cheese. It enables cheese to be cheese and to, you know, it gives all these properties we love about cheese. And we thought, well, what if you could have this protein made out of animals? What if it didn't come from animals? You could then make real cheese that doesn't come from animals. So and essentially a, culture started. a laboratory produced version of casein that performs just like casein that comes from, from uh, animal milk. Exactly. Except, you know, well, it's not really made in laboratory. It's made in proper food production facility. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, that is uh, that uses fermentation, which we'll which we'll talk there about. We this yeah. is the critical technology we use. So we basically um, said this protein you cannot find anywhere else in plants, anywhere else in nature. But what if you could um, what if you could use microbes um, and make them engineer them in a way that they can now actually produce casein like they wouldn't otherwise. But what if they could produce casein if they learned how to do it? If, you know, how how we, and, and mammals know how to do it. If they learned how to do it, if we can teach them how to do it. And that's exactly what we do. We engineer microbes that then specifically, they become specialists in producing this casein protein. And, you know, to, for microbes to produce and secrete anything, you will be familiar with this. If you want microbe to make alcohol, if you want microbe to make acid, to acidify something, yeah, you have to use fermentation. So we use fermentation in a very different way than, you know, what it is used traditionally, but it's the same from an essence of a fermentation process where we use fermentation process of this microbe in, you know, in a large fermentation vat, feeding microbe with sugar, with some simple salts, and we actually then use this microbe to turn what is eating into casein protein, not into alcohol or acid. Ah, so I at the so, end of so the, the fermentation, we have a lot of casein produced. So the microbes transform yes. the, the the raw ingredients into protein called casein. Exactly. Well, let me back up for one second. Just you, the reason you're qualified to be able to know about this and do this is your background is in molecular biology, right? Isn't that your your training? Yes, exactly. So I don't come from food background. I, I had to learn a ton, you know, yeah. about how to make amazing food at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, my background's in molecular biology and biochemistry, protein biochemistry. And most of my academic training has been, you know, in academia related to not food proteins, but proteins that are in our cells that regulate diseases, that regulate cancer, or that regulate neurosignaling. Um, so they're different types of proteins, but again, they're still just proteins. And um, scientifically, there's a lot of similarity in understanding, you know, how a cell, it can be cell in your body, or in this case, it's a microbe, how it's producing a protein and how you can harness that. So, so uh, this is fascinating to me because you know, it's kind of like applied science, you know, in a very directed way. <clears throat> you you bring one piece of the puzzle, the, the molecular biology background. What is Matt's background and what's his strength? Um, Matt, <clears throat> Matt's background and strength is really in, you know, being able to um, have this big vision and come up with ideas with, with big problems to solve and then have the resolve and drive to go and solve it. So he's also a biologist by training, uh -huh. uh, but he, unlike me, he didn't, you know, stay and work in academia and do research in biology. He had a very successful um, a website he founded while he was studying and that became very popular and he got to sell it and work on it. And that got his entrepreneurial bug. Um, and then he he worked in um, other startups in New Zealand while he while he lived there, 
Um, and he was actually looking to start something in, in this field because Matt is a passionate vegan for, you know, over 10 years now. And um, so really when he felt that the timing was right and that he was ready to do, some, you know, had enough experience and drive to jump into it himself. Yeah, that's, that's what he did. And, and he decided to start New Culture. It was really his baby from New Zealand. And then he searched all around the world. Uh, yeah. How did he find you? You're all the way across the other side of the world. Yeah, it's a funny story, but, um, you know, in essence, uh, he tried to behave as he was a recruiter on LinkedIn. <laughs> you know, everyone today uses LinkedIn in, right. in the business world. And because he was really struggling to find someone in New Zealand who would commit to this. Um, you know, this was five years ago. Today, I have to tell there is at least 30 companies in our field doing, you know, similar what things to what we're doing. We have actually a field, which is exciting. But back then it was just us and one other company. So in the whole world. So I, I think people at the time, you know, thought, you know, is this possible? This is a bit crazy. Like um, it was risky. And so he searched for people and contacted me. I was one of many people he contacted and we really clicked that when we connected and, and I, at the time, you know, I was very, I was really looking to move into working in something related to battling climate change. And this sounded like a perfect opportunity where I could wow. use my, my science skills as well. And I, yeah. and I love food. I'm, I'm Croatian. You know, I'm from South Croatia, from Dalmatia. Yeah. We have very strong influence of Italian cuisine. And I, I grew up with a with ton of amazing food. And I, I became vegetarian um, myself later in life. And, you know, as I said, I was, I was really um, missing. I was missing eating a lot of foods. And cheese was something I couldn't give up personally even though I knew it's damage environmentally and, and to the animals. So, so yeah, this, this was like a perfect fit. Basically. So the forces of nature converged and you guys found each other through the internet, through LinkedIn, and somehow made a decision, big decision to each relocate and start a company together. Why the Bay area? There is a few reasons, but you probably are aware that in the Bay Area, there is just such an excitement for uh, new technologies. There is this attitude, you know, can do attitude. In Europe, we tend to be traditional and conservative sometimes about these things, the way we, we approach, you know, food or innovation. And so there's just much more appetite for risk and for trying and developing new things here, as well as that means translates in a lot more, you know, people who can who want to work on this money, funding, um, interest in pizzerias, partners, like everything is just, it's it's there. So, uh, and, and then finally, we actually had accept, been accepted to a program that's called Indie Bio. Yeah, what is that? Uh, that is a startup accelerator program, which really, uh -huh. uh, you know, helps very early stage startups like us, people who are just starting out, nice. gives our early money and gives support and coaching and networking and, and the lab it's space, like, actually. Like an incubator. Exactly. It's an incubator. And they and like, they provided like labs, lab facilities and everything else? For first five months, yeah. So our first wow. five months of the company, we were in this uh program. And that really helped us massively move very fast and be focused and then you know raise our funding round right after. Well that so that so there's a lot of steps because like you said, five years, it's not like an overnight success story. This is taken five years, but but a lot has to happen. And one of those is number you have to have a place to work and do the do the development work. Uh, and then, of course, to raise the funds to make it happen. And then you've got to master the the science and technology to execute. And then and then it moves into production and distribution. And so where are we at in that whole chain of events? Yeah. And, and, and it also moves into food. Right. That's something I do want to talk about is how what uh, makes a finished product that tastes yeah. amazing versus just yeah. a prototype that's, you know, functional. Say. And so, yeah, we're um, when we make our casing, I, I think I didn't mention this, that, you know, that's the biggest challenge. That's the innovation. But that's not the end. We actually have to purify that casing. We have to harvest it out. And the other fermentation, we make it into this protein powder that you can looks like the one for milk basically so it's basically it's a necessary uh, step but it's not sufficient unto itself it, it but you have to have that to take the next step yeah and then you want to turn it into cheese right and that's also right. not trivial you want to learn how do you make then the best cheese with this source that's not milk but that's this different type of milk and you know when you said um that we were are making a product that's not dairy that's actually interesting because we um 
we actually consider our product to be dairy uh, if you, if in some ways, right? It has a protein that's bioidentical to dairy protein. So if you did have allergy to dairy proteins, you would have, you know, allergy to, to our protein. So it's dairy that doesn't come from animals, you know, that's how so we talk That's what about makes it. it vegan. There's that exactly. it come from animals, but it, but it has the characteristics. It's real dairy. Yeah. Exactly. But, although the milk, the milk industry would take exception because they don't want anyone calling their product dairy if it doesn't come from a cow. But, but yeah. I, and I, I agree. Mean. And it's a thin line. That's why I say it's kind of the dual nature of it. But, but you asked about the, the production and, and where we're at. And, um, you know, we took a, it took us a long time, first two, three years of just early development of being able to even demonstrate that you can make this protein in microbes. This is not trivial. This is actually really complex um, and takes several teams and a lot of work to do. Um, and then to show that we can turn it into cheese and cheese that performs certain way. And so we're really now at an exciting point where we've been producing routinely, um, you know, in manufacturing this protein, um, constantly churning, you know, kilograms and kilograms upon kilograms that come in house and that we are turning into cheese. And we've really been for the last two to three years mastering um, this cheese making. And we make phenomenal cheese product today. That, and you, you, know, so you make it right eat, there? The right feedback there is in... disbelief. People say, this is cheese. <laughs> you have your own manufacturing facility for that. You're not uh, farming that out to an existing we company. don't actually own anything in manufacturing. That's really expensive. What you learn is that yeah. the, the capital, you know, expenditure of those projects is massive, and we we don't have that money. Most of our money goes into our development and where we can really contribute uniquely. We partner with existing facilities, both for manufacturing casein and for manufacturing cheese, and that's been great as well. That we don't need to build something that doesn't exist at all, right? Um, these things exist out in the world. People use fermentation to make flavors, molecules these days, proteins, enzymes, and yeah. people use cheese making obviously a lot. So well before we get down the the, the chain of you know production and uh, marketing and all that, I want to go back to the to the original steps. Uh when you talk about using microbes and sort of uh, an essential essentially uh directing the microbes to create the casein, where first of all, where do the microbes come from? Are these naturally occurring in, you know, in existing microbes, are they bacteria? Are they enzymes or what, what are they? Yeah. So microbes are the longest living organisms in nature. They've been all around us as you're, you know, we all learn, I think in school, there are very good microbes that help. They're in our guts that help us digest things. And they're microbes that make us sick, of course. And all microbes came from nature at some point. They, they were somewhere and someone had to domesticate them, just like you domesticate a, a dog or a pet. Yeah. So someone had to pick them up from some source and then grow them and study them and characterize them and say, this is what this microbe does. This is how it smells. This is how it grows. This is what it eats. So yeah, of course, our microbes are the ones that have been adapted and cultivated to, to scientific work, right? And to, you, to work in a lab because they have to be fully controlled. You have to understand them really well, you know, know everything about them in essence. But yeah, at some point, a long time ago, they were harvested from some source and you you can look at all these different libraries of microbes that people found in someone's garden or in, are you know, they technically the uh, are they technically yeast or or bacterial yeah so great great question so um we actually don't talk about this publicly that's kind of still our that's our uh, secret that's our secret uh -huh. sauce uh, but yeah they are one of the very typical so as you mentioned most typical microbes are bacteria or yeast or fungi these are the three most common microbial types that we use, that people use and you could use any of those in principle to turn them you know into engineered microbes that make casein but i well, can't disclose specifically yeah. you know, obviously you got you've got to have your otherwise you know if, if 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 it was easy to do then everybody would do it and you you know and then, this is where you spent you know where you brought your talents and spent a lot of time making those breakthroughs but so but so just so that i can get my head around it I understand as a baker and and a lot of the people who watch and listen to Pizza Quest are pizza makers or bread bakers. They understand how yeast fermentation works, how bacterial, lactic bacterial fermentation exactly. works to create flavors and carbon dioxide and things like that. We also know as bakers that there are enzymes that exist in ingredients that have their own purposes to help break things down and turn it into something else. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, so, for those who are really, you know, love fermentation, I can stress something that's important from technical point of view, is that all those fermentations you talked about, Peter, in from in the dough 
in uh, you know lactic fermentations, they're what we call anaerobic fermentations. They happen without oxygen uh-huh. being around, and that's exactly those ana- those are anaerobic organisms, and that's how they go into metabolic cycles that enable them to produce acid for those molecules. Our fermentation is different in the sense that it's um, aerobic, it's aerobic. oxygenated. Our organisms require um, oxygen. If if we didn't supply with oxygen. They would never make casein. They would also make, you know, acid and other things that ah, come from their metabolism. Yeah, yeah. So, so, that, so when they a... grow in a different condition and these controlled, um, controlled fermentation conditions with presence of oxygen, that's how we enable them to undergo a pathway where they can then turn sugar into casein protein. That's incredible. So, so um, when these microbes um, are in the medium where they have food to be able to propagate and do what they and to do what they do proteins new proteins are formed and and in this case the protein as it's not a gluten protein that's formed it's a casein protein that's being formed as a result of the activity of these of these microbiological organisms am i saying that right is that exactly yeah yeah that's exactly what happened so do you get can you actually see it? I mean, can you see that formation happen when you when you introduce the microbes to the to the medium and and you see the 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 threads of protein form and how how is casein protein different from let's say a gluten protein or other kinds of, you know, proteins that exist in meats and things like that? Yeah. That's a great question. So you can actually see uh things happening in fermentation just macroscopically. Proteins are such small molecules that you can't see them. I mean, even with a microscope, they are on a scale that you can't imagine, like they're on you know, nanometer scale. So you can't see individual molecules, but you can actually see the turbidity and the color changing of the of the media in which microbe is growing. And you can tell by that how much production has been happening. So you can absolutely see the change in the broth that you're using. Interesting. And, you know, yeah, and we yeah. use that as one of the metrics as to how further the fermentation progress. That's so absolutely. And in terms of differences, um, I would say um, there, there are some similarities actually, interestingly, with casein and gluten, although they're very, very different biochemically in detail. But um, what is, I would, I would, I would uh, contrast casein to maybe um, more typical proteins that are used in food that people know of like whey protein that's in milk uh-huh. um, or egg proteins, for example. Um, those proteins are uh, what we call globular proteins. They look like little balls, like little blobs. Uh-huh. They have very particular structures, and um, and they are by themselves uh, typically very very functional proteins. Uh, but they cannot again form this alignment and network that makes cheese. And casein is actually very weird because it's like unraveled spaghetti. It's what we call intrinsically disordered protein. So it doesn't have that bowl structure. It actually looks like spaghetti, like unraveled yeah. spaghetti. Uh-huh. Uh, but that makes it actually pretty difficult to work with and to understand how to get it to activate, to be in that perfect alignment and to start forming fibers and strands, like you're saying. So it actually yeah. does form that. And that's what enables the stretch and melt and all the properties of cheese. And that's where there's a lot of magic, you know, um, um, real, real stuff, but magic to us, just how interesting and beautiful it is is how these proteins turn from just these individual molecules into this beautiful network that is that is cheese. Yeah, I like the for me an analogy that comes to my mind. Tell me if it's just, if this makes sense. Is like when you're making bread and there's two proteins in bread. There's gliadin and gluten, and neither of which can make the the bread dough so stretch. But when they bond to each other and find each other after you add water, suddenly you've got a new protein that wasn't there before, and and so. This and this protein does have stretchability and extensibility and everything else. Is that kind of like what's happening with exactly? Yeah, process? that's kind of and casein just does it by itself. It interacts with itself, and it it, it casein interacts with itself and with calcium. It's a calcium binding protein. It's really interesting. That's why in milk evolutionary, you know, it was developed as a source for younglings to have very dense protein and calcium content. So it uses salts that are in milk to as a bridging as interactions. At, and and it uses um, heat, uh, and that's because it's already unraveled. Heat cannot damage it. When you have these globular proteins, these little balls, they're damaged by heat and then become unfunctional. So oh. if you you know heat the egg, it unfolds that way, or or way. But casein's already unfolded that way, 
um, and can be heated. And in these transitions that undergoes, it forms by itself these kind of almost like we call polymers. So like fibers in some way that uh, that give that give you the the structure. Like strands. They can make strands. Exactly. Yeah. This is fascinating stuff. I mean, especially for people that don't have, uh, you know, a chemistry or biochemistry background like myself. Uh, it's kind of like we can, well, pizza pizza makers and bread makers, we can geek out on this kind of stuff because we're, we're we're so fascinated. We know how to do it, but we don't don't always know why it's working. And and we're at that stage, I think, in the artisan movements of all these products that we also want to know why, not just how. And okay. uh, and so you so you've you've taken that same thing and applied it to create something pretty much totally new then yeah absolutely because this product category as i say it doesn't exist in the market today you um you cannot go and buy cheese like this still like our cheese that we're going to actually start selling this year is the first um first product you'll be able to buy of this kind and i'm sure there'll be many many more to come which is really exciting now you can go to buy animal derived dairy cheese or you can go to buy these plant-based vegan cheeses that will have no protein typically yeah. Uh, that won't perform. Uh, and this is a new category that we're creating and we're very excited about that. That's that's exciting. And also you mentioned that it's not really out there yet. It's not available. Do you have a timeline when when people who are listening to this show can have a sense of when can I get my hands on some of this? Yeah, there is some of it that I can talk about now and some that I can't that's going to be announced later this year. But uh, absolutely, okay. if, you, if you follow us, you might know that um, we are going to be selling our product in restaurants and pizzerias for a long time. We see this big opportunity to, you know, if you could make, and, and we can, if you are now making this amazing mozzarella that makes amazing pizza, what better way to showcase it than with great chef, with a great yeah. restaurant, with a great recipe, right? Um, eventually, we're going to sell it to consumers, but that's going to take a while. Well, you've already got um, one great chef in your in your. Uh back pocket here exactly talk, so we're so excited it's on yeah. your website so i think you're allowed to talk about that right i can absolutely so when we went out to this quest it was a quest for us peter of looking for you know who's gonna be this first person in the world who's gonna sell our cheese this first chef we made a list and we we have several of course chefs that we are big fans of and obsessed with and and many many we want to work with but there this person was on the top of our list yeah. Literally. And we were so fortunate that, you know, we were able to impress her and uh, with the quality of our cheese and that she decided to be our partner. So that's Nancy Silverton. Um, Nancy's Pizzeria Moza in L.A. will be the first place in the world where you can go and eat our cheese later this year. And it's been just incredible working with Nancy on, you know, using the cheese, developing recipes um, for the launch, um, working with her team. And, you know, we're just impressed with um, her work ethic, her integrity she has. As yeah. a chef. It's just, it's been wonderful. You, you couldn't have landed a better chef to be, a, in a sense, your ambassador for this because she, first of all, she's obsessed with cheese. Yeah. Her restaurants are phenomenal. We've had Nancy on a number of times on, on Pizza Quest and we love her. And, uh, and Pizzeria Mozo is one of my favorite pizzerias in the world. And the fact that she likes what you've created is about you know it's kind of like getting the imprimatur from the pope so <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's the, the final approval and, and on your website i think there's there's a very short video of nancy actually making pizza with your cheese is that correct yeah we had a very exciting ele- event last year uh that was happening that was at moza it wasn't a, a, a commercial event it was just private event we organized and invited a bunch of people <laughs> And um, it was at Moza and um, Nancy, Nancy and her team served the entire menu, dinner menu with our cheese in uh, different dishes, um, arancini bowls and um, uh, eggplant parm, which was really exciting to see how cheese browns and makes this beautiful, almost like crust. And then uh, and then in pizza, we actually um, uh, we talked a lot with Nancy about this and she she was herself overthinking that. She doesn't want our cheese to just be a replacement. She says it's a it's a product of its own that deserves its own attention. It's its own category, and it's a great product. It's not just some replacement. So originally, we were thinking, you know, we would use pizzas that she already makes, and re- and when people come, they could be offered. You can replace it with our cheese, uh, such as margarita. Margarita is a classic, sure. and you will be able to buy margarita with our cheese and with animal derived cheese at Nancy's restaurant. But Nancy also insisted to develop this special recipe that is going to be just for our cheese. So meaning there will be a completely novel pizza served 
that you can only get with our cheese and you can't get it. Yeah, you can't get it with any other cheese. Exactly. Well, with well, mozzarella is a great cheese because it, you know, it, ha- it can it can be you know used fresh and young. It can be aged. It can be smoked. It, lots of things can happen with mozzarella itself. So, uh, so it has its own flavor profiles. Um, so, this raises for me two questions. Number one, if you can do it with mozzarella, if you can make a mozzarella cheese, what other cheeses can you make using your process? And and two, can the, the mozzarella that you're creating be used at these various stages? Can it be used fresh, dry? Can it be, you know, can it be used exactly the same way mozzarella is used? And how is that flavor profile, you know, similar and different from cow's milk mozzarella or buffalo mozzarella? The short answer is that, yes, it's all possible. The, The longer and more complicated answer is that each of these becomes a new product, just like any new cheeses. People have spent thousands of years perfecting those. And and takes us time to develop and perfect. But if you go to understanding of uh, how cheese gets turned into cheese, right? You start with milk and milk in essence is water, protein, fat primarily, and then some sugar, which we didn't talk about. uh, That's lactose and lactose only comes from animals. And in our cheese, we have no lactose because it doesn't come from animals. We use plant-based sugar. So that's a big advantage for, for a ton of consumers. So if you look at those building blocks, we can make, if and milk turns into cheese, right? We can make any cheese in the world by our milk, but our by our starting point. But because our starting point is going to be slightly different to what is, you know, coming from animals. Like we are making the protein part, but we don't make the fat. Fat we use is plant-based fat. Sugar we use is plant-based sugar. Yes. So it's this kind of hybrid product that has some parts that is dairy protein and then some parts that is plant-based. And from there, we have to develop and optimize the recipes to make tastiest products. But yes, it's absolutely possible to turn them into a variety of cheeses of choices. And I can't tell, you know, which ones are going to be easy to make or harder yeah. to make and which ones are going to be like extremely tasty and which ones are going to be just OK. Um, some of the cheeses really depend on fat component. Fat is important, especially in aging in the lipolysis process. So, you know, some of them may be very hard cheeses. Maybe our cheeses won't taste exactly identical as yeah. the animal counterpart, uh, but will they be close enough that people can't tell the difference? You know, or that's will they what just we're be delicious for. enough that people don't care if they're different? Exactly, that's what we're really aiming for. Yeah. 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 Well, well, let me uh, let me throw a couple of questions at you based on my limited knowledge of cheese. Well, we had some shows here with some cheese experts where we talk about that. So we know that mozzarella falls in a category of cheese called pasta filata which means it's stretch cheese, which makes sense based on the description you gave us of, of how the casein works and forms into cheese. So that's a stretch style cheese. The, another huge category, and really one of my favorite categories, is the cheddar style of cheeses, which is, you know, so the cheddaring process, it doesn't stretch the cheese the way mozzarella is stretched, but it, it it's reformed, it's kind of repacked. And then the, the interaction with air and with whatever bacteria that are introduced during fermentation, so this is where fermentation comes in, create flavors. Blue cheese then is another type of cheese where some of the bacteria introduced after the process is, is like almost like penicillin, you know, and it creates these blue molds. All these, these this is where fermentation uh, becomes like the other kinds of microbes other than the one that makes the casein, exactly. the flavor producing microbes enter the picture. All of that's possible with your products? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you would basically... Um... That's a second fermentation to our first fermentation. Yeah, yeah. The protein. And like you with can brie, then use the, the, the traditional the fermentation end. there that you you know of, and maybe it is gun gonna be different because our starting material is somewhat different. Maybe, you know, with time, what we've seen in plant-based world, plant-based world also uses fermentation of nuts, uh, things like that. That again doesn't make to my taste, amazing product, but makes it some cate- category of product that has specific flavor. People have been developing these microbes called starter cultures. So starter cultures you use yeah. to make cheese. They've been developing even new specialized starter cultures for plant-based cheeses, right? So what I see happening is that we we would be using more the ones that are for dairy, for, for traditional cheeses, but maybe we would have adapt them and have different cultures that are differently adapted to the fat we're using, yes. all of these different things. But absolutely, yeah, we can use fermentation in our milk system, in our, you know, with our casein protein 
um, to make yogurts or any dairy product, not just cheese. In other words, you're going to need an R and D laboratory to be able to keep rolling out, you know, variations on this original theme. You've got your master product, and now you can see where it goes, which is exciting for me. I love the the, the possibilities to create an entire family of cheeses beyond yeah. just the mozzarella pasta filata style cheeses into other styles. Uh, and I can't wait to see where that all goes. Um, so how do you, number one, can you produce, how do you produce enough volume to meet if, if there's an outcry for this? I, we want it. I mean, which is your hope. We want this product. We want to do what Nancy's doing. We want to put it on the menu and we want to create products around it. How do you produce enough for this, for the, for the demand? Yeah. This is where we want to be honest and don't want to, you know, frustrate people because of course it becomes frustrating. We do have some big fans who have been following us from early days and they're like, oh my God, it's five years. I can't wait anymore. I want this product everywhere. But we do ask for that patience and we ask for the understanding that technology we're developing existed before. All of them existed in different shapes and forms, but we're combining them together. This aerobic fermentation, the microbe, the casing protein, the cheese in completely new way. And this takes time and effort and and it's not something anyone can just do overnight in their kitchen to start with so it took us a long way to come where we are and you know right now we'll be supplying a few restaurants so that's a pretty modest amount for the dairy industry we're aware of that but that's a big leap for us yeah and do you have a target date i forgot to ask you this earlier a target date for when it will be available you know on the menu at at uh, pizzeria moza and Maybe at some of your I, other restaurants. I don't want to spill the beans of my, our commercial team because they're, you know, that's going to be yeah. their exciting news. But yeah, it's going to be later this year for sure. But this year, it'll be yeah. in this calendar yeah. year. For sure, think. yeah. Uh, for sure, we're going to be yeah. at, at Moza um, and then expanding into a few other restaurants that I can't I can't talk yet about. Sure. Um, but to your point, how do we produce? Um, it all becomes a challenge of money, workforce, materials, and manufacturing capacity at that point because technology is now developed. And that takes also time, believe it or not, to find and source and do and produce at those levels. We have to produce first a lot of casein, then turn it into a lot of cheese. So every year as we go by now, we will be scaling that more and more, and we'll be having to find more and more manufacturing partners and capacity, and we'll need a lot more money. Well, that's my other question is, how do you fund all of this? Have Have you been on Shark Tank or are you going to foundations or to Silicon Valley? How are you getting the funding? Because this is... This is an expensive process. It is. It's expensive. And what's expensive is mainly paying the manufacturing facilities to run our process in their spaces using their people. That that costs the most money. And so, um, so far, we have been funded uh, by um, in investment money, so venture capital money. Primarily, uh, we've been going through, we went through two fundraising rounds so far. So, uh, and, you know, we are now this year actually going through another fundraising round. We have to raise quite a big amount of money this year because now that we're at this exciting part with our technology is ready and can be deployed, now it's about saying, hey, okay, now you need to give us this money so we can deploy it and scale because all these people are waiting and craving for this product. And honestly, there has been enormous demand for this product yes. from chefs, from restaurants, pizzerias, consumers. That's been so exciting to see, but also painful to us that we're kind of in a way, disappointing them. Um, But again, I would tell them, think about the time where people had to develop solar panels or they developed electric vehicles. These things are now normal and we use them, but it took 10, 20 years for these technologies to come to market. So this is just how it is with technology development with, you know, and um, yeah, and I know it's hard. I know Everyone wants this cheese. But well, well, we're chomping so, at the bit, we say, too. Yeah, you, but with the funding thing. round we raised this year, we're going to be, trust us, we're going to be torpedoing a lot of that money into, you know, getting the product out there to more people in the next two years. I feel like we're like this, like we're doing an episode of how I built this, you know, for National Public Radio, that that show where it talks about how you how you create something because you're creating a, com- a company from nothing and you're creating a funny cheese. You say, funny you say that, but we've been on how I built this with guys. You were. No, you are. I got to yeah. find that episode. Well, I feel like that's what we're, we're doing our own version of that episode because yes. I'm learning how you built this. Um uh, for people who want to follow you and follow the story, uh, what what are the best ways to follow you? I know you've got a website, newculture.com, right? Newculture.com. Uh, that's that's what where I got most of my information about you is reading the, the 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 blogs and stuff there. But do you also have social media? 
Yes. So I would say our website is great because we write blogs and we do release our news there directly. We also look for partners or, you know, employees there. Um, so reach out to us through through our website. Um, we do have multiple social media pages, uh, LinkedIn for a lot of our kind of business professional network, uh, Instagram, uh, where, you know, we try to share with, as I say, with the fans and with people who support and follow our work. We're so grateful that there's is, a group of people supporting and following our work patiently. Is Instagram it's just at new culture? New uh, col- new it's culture. all with different handles. That's new culture cheese. New culture yeah. cheese. So yes. for Instagram, at new culture cheese, when you yes. look it up, those of you who are listening, when you want to jump on that. So, uh, so I'm going to, I got to write that down myself because I want to look at what you got there. So you've got posts already there. Yes. And then we have, you know, a Facebook page. Um, and then definitely, um, if you just Google us, you'll find a lot of uh, interviews and materials. And I would say very rich source uh, is how I build this with with Guy Raz yeah. uh, and a bunch of other, um, some of the more technical podcasts where we talked about like details of, you know, casing, how it works and um, things like that um, you can find find online. How was that like for you going on uh, How I Built This? That's a terrific show. Uh, did you have fun doing that? It was incredible. And it was also uh, a bit surreal. It's kind of surreal, all of this, just like working with Nancy uh, in sense that, um, you know, we're so new to the field and we feel very much like we have, like we do have, we have a lot to learn and we're just, you know, there's, there's decades to learn. And um, we're very, yeah, we're just grateful for Guy um, talking to us. We're a big, big fan of, of his show. We've been following it for a long time ourselves and, you know, hearing about a lot of other amazing companies. And right, that's uh, how how people learn from each other is the things that, that you hear on those shows. Yeah. So, which is what we're hoping folks who are listening here today, you know, that you, you know, if you've got an idea and you want to build it, uh, you know, here's a great uh, example, a model for how to build an idea into a business. And, uh, and it sounds like one of the important ingredients aside from know-how and, you know, and, 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 and ingredients is, is understanding patience and time. Oh yes. I would say that's the most important one is to understanding that, you know, to build something from scratch, it take, will take decades maybe. And um, that's what we're in for, but this is not a, this is Have you ever come problem. close to just pulling the plug on this? Have you gotten to the, hit the wall and you go, it's not working. We can't, you know, I don't know if we want to keep going or, or has it just been. Oh yeah. Daily, you know, <laughs> you know? daily. You hit the wall daily and it, um, you know, sometimes small, sometimes really big. Sometimes it was so challenging. We thought, you know, is this ever going to work? We should just throw this on the gurgle. Um, but no, you come back the next day, yeah, yeah. think afresh, start again. And, um, and look where we are today. We actually make this cheese that we can feed to people. And and one of the things that's exciting to me is, is that it's so early in the game. I mean, you've got a lifetime worth of opportunity here to, to grow this into a lot of other things. The technology that you're using to create the casein can create other things as well. And then the casein itself can create different kinds of cheeses. We could have a whole family of cheeses that, uh, you know, of different styles and types that, that are comparable to what's out there in the mammalian cheese world. <laughs> I like how you're thinking, Peter, because you're thinking exactly, you're seeing the potential and thinking combinatorially. So yeah, we could make, that's awesome. where sometimes it gets challenging because you can get excited and too dis- excited and then the excitement can lead to distraction because it can be like, I want to try all these different things. And I think the key to our success, honestly, so far was discipline and focus was to say, um, if we want to have a big impact, we our, our goal is to lead the global transition to an animal-free dairy future. This is not a small thing to do. This is a very big thing to do. We want to transition the entire world one day to yeah. beautiful dairy that doesn't come from animals. Yeah, there's a much bigger sense of mission here than just... Yeah, but cheese. if we yeah. want to have an impact and we want to be successful in these early days, we have to show it on something that's really meaningful. And to us, that is pizza and mozzarella because it's the largest market in the U.S. It's where people love their pizza and it's where most of the emissions come from, most of the negative impact because it's the largest volume. Yeah, we don't even so think really, about by that. By being focused on this one cheese now, you know, it enables us to to really put the dent into the, into this market. Uh, Speaking of which, will you be coming to pizza expo in March to uh, meet all these great pizza makers that you may end up becoming customers for you later? Yeah. New culture for sure. I personally won't be there because I have another conference (laughs) that week that is about, uh, you know, future of food technology that we go Uh to, but 
Absolutely. Our commercial team, um, actually, they go every year for, for a few years now and build. We, we do have now really wonderfully strong network within the pizza industry. Uh, and, you know, four years ago, no one knew about us, but now right. people actually do know about us. And, and thanks to you as well and people like you who actually spread the, the word about us within the culinary world and the pizza world, not just the, you know, cheese world or the technology world. We'll have your folks uh, swing by. We're going to be making podcasts at the Pizza Expo itself. Uh, I'll be uh, I'll be located in the Pizza University booth, uh, recording you know with some of the the uh, pizza dignitaries and and uh, pizza celebrities that are going to be at the at the expo. So if if your folks could swing by, we'd love to you know meet them and maybe even get a quick soundbite from them that we can put on one of the shows. Amazing! I'll tell them, and I'm very jealous because I yeah I think it's I would. Pizza Expo is like the most amazing. Yeah. Meeting. I'm going to another fun one, but I would rather be at the, at the I'm, I'm interested so. in this other one, uh, the future of food. Now, where will that be held? Because that I, in the Bay Area? Yeah. In San Francisco. Yeah. This is the biggest conference in the entire field of, uh, you know, as it says, future of food. So novel foods and novel ways of making food. And it's annually, uh, it's in San Francisco in March at the same time, usually when the Pizza Expo is in That's Vegas. Uh, That's too bad because I'd come after that. I'd love to come after that. Yeah, and we've been going there also since inception, since like five years now, and it's really grew. In the beginning, it was a small niche thing because the field was smaller. Now it's really big, and it covers all kinds of products from the top innovation in plant based products to fermentation derived products to you know also fermentation that makes, for example, uh, a biomass like uh, mycelium. It's a type of fungi. Yeah. So mycelium uh, products, uh, and then it covers cultivated meat products as well and seafood. So seafood and meat that comes from real cells that are then grown also in, in fermenters and, yes. and bioreactors to make uh, cultivated products. So it covers all these different types of uh, technologies that are, you know, considered the future, that will be future of food. This is how we're going to be contributing to feeding our growing population. Will you be uh, uh, presenting anything there or just... Uh... Uh, just walking the floor. I, this time, I think I'm only uh, partaking. Last year, I was on on a, on a panel there. I usually I usually uh, am on a panel, and this year uh, I'm mainly excited. We're gonna have um, a little booth there, and we're we're just excited to chat with people and have people come by and tell them about what we do and about our products. It's gonna be more just chatting and meeting meeting people. Wow, that's exciting. Well, Inya, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. For we get to be part of the the uh, sort of uh, uh, breaking news part of your your journey, and and uh, you know we put a couple teasers out there. So if folks who are listening, you know, you're gonna just have to put it on your radar and and stay alert to when it's going to be available. And uh, uh, one final question before we uh, you know kind of wrap things up is is because the the supply is going to be limited at first you know supply and demand go together what's how's the price point working in this will it be competitive with cheese great question and and i would recommend when our commercial teams at the expo you can you know chat to them yes, about huh? that <laughs> in more detail cuz they are the ones who know inside out uh, and that's how probably you saw the report we just we just published um so uh because what we develop is currently challenging still to make and it's not subsidized by government or anyone or anything we cover the full cost um for 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 a while till we really enlarge the production um this will be a premium product it will be more expensive it will carry a premium tag but it's important to understand that it will be very much within what consumers are interested and willing to pay and that's our latest consumer research is, has shown this so we have uh seen in our in our latest consumer research that People are so excited about this product that they're willing to pay up to $4 more per pizza if our cheese was on it. And, wow. you know, we've seen this with gluten-free crust, for example, the same thing happened. Uh, there, is a, there is a precedent there. Um, today, plant-based cheeses that are sold at pizzerias, they are sold also at, at a higher price, somewhat higher price, and they're not good. So you're getting a yeah. not a great product for higher price. So there will be some premium for the first few years. But what's really exciting is that when we are at that really large scale, you know, the, the scale where we're producing uh, uh, millions of, of pounds regularly, um, we are going to be cost competitive, actually, even with the, the animal dairy that's, you know, subsidized today. So that's really exciting to us because that means that it will be a, a no brainer for people to switch. It will 
they will be able to buy it at, a, at the same price and they'll get same quality, tasty product that they know they, they can be proud of. They consume, it doesn't come from animals. It doesn't, you know, damage the earth. Um, so that's, that's absolutely where we, where we're heading to with our technology. Okay. Any ch- any plans to go on Shark Tank? No, not, not. not. You're too big. You're too big actually for Shark Tank. You, you, your, your investment yeah. levels now are going to be, you know, stratospheric compared to, to that show. But anyway, it's all, it's, it's very exciting. This whole, the whole entrepreneurial spirit, the scientific, you know, uh, development that's going on here and the fact that it's part of a, of a, of a big movement. A big movement that's really all about the future of this planet, not just the future of food, but which which controls the future of the planet. So, thank you for all of that work. Thank you for your passion. Uh, please uh, thank Matt also for for kind of uh, getting this thing going and connecting with you. and And uh, we'll be following you and and tracking all of this. And and later on, when we're a little further down the the road with with distribution and and it's getting out there, let's see if you guys can come back on again. And uh, we'll talk, you know, give everybody an update on what's going on with uh, new culture cheese. And I, I, I can't help but thinking new culture cheese and other products. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Peter. Right. Yeah, we really, really appreciate it. We're so grateful for In your honor, Thank you so much. And again, for those who are listening, it's uh, new culture dot com for the is that like new culture dot com for the website. Yeah. You can get to all the other the Instagrams and everything is new culture cheese, et cetera, et cetera. Follow them um, and yeah. uh, and look for, if you're in the L.A. area, look for it to show up at least at Pizzeria Moza sometime in the in the year 2024. And yes, and we, you will know when it's there. We will, you know, we'll tell you about it. Yeah, and, uh, beautiful. Please come come to Nancy's restaurant. Best of success. And thank you again for being, you know, with us today. And thank all of you who are watching and listening to Pizza Quest. We'll see you at the next episode. Pizza Quest is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.